Great. Okay, we're back again. And uh, I've asked Lloyd to do something special rather than moving on to his PowerPoint that he has all in sequence. And he's done a great job of putting that in sequence for our sake so that we can follow the categories that he is introducing in uh, his talks on Sharia law. I've asked him to stop and hold a minute and to unpack what he said in episode number nine. You remember he talked about the creed uh, that they go by commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. That's the creed that all Muslims live by. But how do they implement that? And how do they actually impose that on others? And uh, Lloyd introduced that very quickly in his last episode. And I was shocked by what I heard. I, it's not that it was new to me. It's just I had no idea that the seven levels of sequence that he introduced were so stringent and also so overbearing. So I've asked him to come back to unpack them much more to give us a better eye view, because this is what we're going to have to be aware of. These are the I, criteria that Muslims follow that so far, I don't think any of you are aware of this. I don't think any of you, I've not been aware of it, and I'm an expert on Islam. Uh, so it's good for Lloyd, who is, this is his area of expertise, for him to introduce this new material. Don't just run through it very quickly, but to show how it will be impinge as you they make contact with others, especially in this area of commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. Now, what we had, one other thing I need to say before I move on, Many of you have been asking about Lloyd's material. You want to know where they can get, he can, uh, you can get a hold of it. Lloyd has promised that he would give it to you. We tried to put it up in a number one of the episodes, but for some reason, YouTube kept on corrupting the URL. I don't know why they do it. I have no control over that. That's YouTube. So what we have decided, Lloyd has given me the latest URL where all of his material is housed in, in one place. That's for you to use. And you can see at the top of every one of the description box in the previous episodes, including this one. And from here on out, I will put that URL so you can go and, uh, and enjoy the material to your heart's content. There's an enormous amount of downloads that you can pull down, PDFs. These are also videos and also books that you need to be have in your library so these are all there uh we want to thank you lloyd for what you're doing thanks for giving us all this okay. material thanks for giving it to us freely we don't have to pay a cent for it so every one of these episodes will now have that both in the description box and i'm also pinning it in the comments so that it'll be the first comment you see okay lloyd now with that in mind let's go ahead and unpack this commanding the right and forbidding the wrong and what in the world is this sevenfold sequence you mentioned? Woo! Help us bring it to life and tell us how that is going to be implemented. All right. I look forward to doing that. Um, yep. Yeah, so, so thanks again. Good to be back, Jay. I'm glad to see you're feeling much better. You're looking much better. Yep. Yeah, so let me share my screen. We'll begin with that. All right. Everyone should see my screen now. This is my copy of The Reliance of the Traveler. This is available in my archive, which has right now over 1,400 books. It's roughly 15 gigabytes of academic material, encyclopedias and references. Of course, I use professional search software to index it and then search through it. So it would help if you did that. However, everything that I am referencing here is available. Please download it, read it, check it for yourself. With regards to commanding the right and forbidding the wrong, I'd like to make one observation. We have been showing and another episode will show the Akida. This is the Islamic equivalent of the Nicene Creed, which expressly, explicitly tells Muslims to hate non-Muslims. We've been showing in all of these episodes so far that Muslims are required, it is mandated by Allah, that Muslims must hate non-Muslims. I have been repeatedly asking Muslims to please show me where in the Akida, their version, their equivalent of the Nicene Creed, and in the Sharia laws where Allah says to love non-Muslims, to love Jews, to love Christians. Not a single one has been able to answer. I have, I have not had nothing but the runaround because it does not exist. Hatred is mandated. And we've shown that with the doctrine of al-wala wal bara and it is also in the Islamic creed. Now, what we have here is the Reliance of the Traveler. This is the index. And you'll see here sections A, 
to sections Z, well, Z for Americans. This is a very fairly detailed, very lengthy book. For instance, marriage, you've got, and divorce, you've got a fair number of pages here, right? So you can learn everything you need to know about these topics. This is a single volume compendium. So it's extremely useful, but also notice here, you have a certification by Al-Azhar. It has numerous certifications to prove its authenticity from the major Islamic institutions in the world. And of course, look at section B, the validity of following qualified scholarship. That's a topic for another day, but the scholars, it is obligatory to follow them. I am going to go now to page 16 in the PDF, and I want to show you this certification of Al-Azhar University, who at the very moment as I'm showing this, will all suddenly become not real Muslims. Now, Al-Azhar Islamic Research Academy has certified, we certify that the above mentioned translation corresponds to the Arabic original and conforms to the practice and faith of the Orthodox Sunni community. Jay, remember we were talking about the four different schools, the four madhabs. They do not see them as four madhabs, they are Sunni. We should not make that distinction. It is not as relevant a distinction as people would like to think it is. It's just Sunni. And so this translation of this, the most popular Sharia manual, the most popular Islamic law manual in the world, conforms to the practice and faith of the Sunni community, the Al Al Sunnah Al Jama'ah, and there is no objection to printing and circulating it. And this is from the General Director of Research, and it has the seal of Al Asad. So this thing is authentic. It is, it is the single most authenticated Islamic law manual in the world. So now we're going to have a look at the doctrine of commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. This is book Q, right? In the PDF, it's page 731. So let's go. Within the contents, Muslims have the obligation to command the right. Now, this is, of course, euphemistic language. It is language of propaganda. It's the, it's the obligation to tell people what to do. If you want to look at it that way, it is literally the obligation to tell people what to do, and if they don't, to force them to do it. It is a communal obligation. This is an important thing. This word has a very strong legal meaning. It is not just a random dictionary word. It has a specific legal meaning. There are two different kinds of obligations in Islam. There's the Fad al-Ain and the Fad al-Kifaya. Fad al-Ain is a personal obligation, also translated sometimes as a universal obligation, like the obligation to pray. It's a personal obligation. It's something that falls upon every Muslim. However, there's also what they call a communal obligation which falls upon the community, but doesn't have to be performed by everyone. I will cover this in law later. This will be more relevant when we talk about the laws of jihad and the laws of dimitude. However, in short, the communal obligation is a requirement. So those Muslims who follow the doctrine of azimah, of strictness, they must perform this. It is obligatory upon them to perform this action or Allah will abandon the Ummah, Allah will abandon them to sin. They will all fall into the hellfire. So they will lose Allah's favor. So therefore, so for instance, prayer is Fad al kifaya as is Jihad. Not every single Muslim has to perform violent Jihad, but some must. And if they do not, then the crime of non-performance has been committed and the entire Muslim Ummah is then found guilty by Allah. Understand that, right? I'm not going to say anything more about that, but let's but leave that for later. Real quickly, yes. could you just spell out <clears throat> Fad al Qain and Fad al Kifaya? How would you spell Of course, that? yes. So, so, you have the Fad, sometimes with an H, doesn't matter. Fad al Ain and Fad al Kifaya. You can see that clearly? A K I F A Y A. You will find variations in spelling with H, without H. You will, you will find variations that it will be similar. Fad al Ain. So, personal obligation and communal obligation. This is communal obligation. This is personal obligation. These are very important. The prayer is a communal obligation. The jihad is a communal obligation. Please understand there's at least 14 kinds of jihad. So, if you're not performing violent jihad, there are other kinds of jihad that may also be performed. Now, let's have a look. There's an obligation upon the community to command the right. It is a communal obligation, and there are levels of censure. Right Now, the degrees of severity in Q5.1. One, explain that something is wrong. But notice the first one. 
knowledge of the wrong act. Muslims must know. Now, many people say, well, Muslims don't know the Sharia. Perhaps they don't know ex explicitly every word of it, but they understand the spirit of it or the gist of it. They are required to know some of the Sharia. They are required to know some of the Islamic sacred law, even if they don't know every last word of it. They are supposed to consult a scholar if they want to know more details. However, they have an idea of what it is, of what the law of Allah is. Now, once you have knowledge of the wrong act, right? Of course, you'll see certain sections say that Muslims are not to trifle themselves with the technical details of scholastic theology. That's the Kalam. This is beyond their purview. However, understanding the law as it applies to them, that is something they should know. Then they have to know what it is. Then they must explain what is wrong. Then they must forbid the act verbally. They must speak. Then they must censure with harsh words. This includes verbal abuse. You remember the case of Ijaz, who was verbally abusing and doxed someone not that long ago, in, in last year. He was using the most horrendous slurs. You can think of the language of Muhammad Ijab. That is actually required. And notice they are following the doctrine to the letter using harsh words, which is abuse. We'll have a look at that in a moment. Writing the wrong by hand. This is not using a pen and writing something down. This is using your hand. I will let you think how that can play out. Then intimidation, then assault, then force of arms. Getting a gang together and ganging up on someone, this is part of this process. So let's have a look at what this tells us. The discussion and analysis that follow are Imam Ghazali's. Remember I spoke of the most qualified Islamic scholar after Muhammad himself is Imam Ghazali, the hujat, the proof of Islam followed by the four imams who founded the schools of fiqh as the most authoritative imams. And he was, and also this book, so he was a Shafi'i scholar. And this was then edited by a Hanbali scholar. So there's cross collaboration by scholars, the Sunni, this division into different schools is less important than people realize. And then this section is to discuss the practical implications of an important aspect of sacred law. So one should know that commanding the right and forbidding the wrong is the most important fundamental of the religion. This is the most important doctrine, the foundational doctrine of Islam. It is the mission that Allah sent the prophets to fulfill. Notice not Muhammad, all prophets. Remember, Abraham was a Muslim. Noah was a Muslim. David was a Muslim. Jesus was a Muslim. Adam was a Muslim. Eve was a Muslim. Muhammad was the first Muslim, Khadija was the first Muslim, Adam was the first Muslim, Abraham was the first Muslim. Islamic logic. But it says here, if commanding the right, or in other words, telling people what to do, were folded up and put away, Islam itself would vanish. It would have no purpose. Without commanding the right, Islam would have no purpose dissolution appear and whole lands come to ruin. So Islam would vanish, dissolution would appear and whole lands would come to ruin. So, right. There is the obligation to command the right. Section Q 1.0. Let there be a group of you who call to good. This is the Islamic definition, the Sharia definition of good. Commanding the right and forbidding the wrong for those are the successful. Quran 3 104. This verse explains that commanding the right and forbidding the wrong are a communal obligation rather than a personal obligation. All of you command the right. So now it says here, let there be a group of you and not all of you to command the right. So if enough people do it, meaning that whenever a wrong is seen, one of those who see it corrects it. The responsibility is lifted from the rest and those who perform it being expressly mentioned as the successful, they get a great reward. They'll get a double reward from Allah. There are many verses in the Quran about commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. Those who keep within Allah's limits and those who transgress them or allow them to be compromised may be compared to people on a ship, some of whom must stay below deck in the hardest and worst place, while others get passage above. When those below need water, they pass through those on the upper deck, injuring and annoying them until those below reflect. If we were to make a hole in the hull, we could get water without troubling those above. So in other words, the minions, the lay people, they don't know what they're doing and they must be managed by those above them, those with the knowledge, those with the sacred knowledge, the imams. Were those above deck to leave those below to themselves, everyone would be destroyed. While if they were to help them, all would be saved. So in other words, these people know better than you and they are doing what is good for you because they are so smart and they will, they will manage you. 
your thoughts, Jay, before I continue? Just if you could just go back and show me what that re reference is again, the Quranic reference. 3104. All right. So it says here, whoever of you sees something wrong, let him change it with his hand. If unable to, change it with your tongue. And if unable, then with your heart. And that is the weakest degree of faith. So a strong Muslim will change things with his hand. How he changes it with his hand, well, we're going to be discussing that. But if you think it involves weapons or violence, you would be correct. So would you like to add anything, Jay, before I continue? No, you're going through these very quickly, and I hope you unpack them, because each one of these yes. has implications yes. for us, who are the ones are that, that will have will have them imposed on us. Yeah, they will discuss it one by one. So this is the this is the preliminaries as we go through, and then they will discuss each one in sequence. Now it states here that commanding the right, so you will command the right and you'll forbid the wrong or Allah will put the worst of you in charge of the best of you and the best will supplicate and be left unanswered. So if Muslims do not follow this doctrine, Allah will abandon you. The Ummah will fall into ruin and disrepute. So you have to command the right and we shall see more about what that is. Now, O you who believe you are responsible for yourselves, those who go astray will not harm you if you are guided. While we have heard the messenger of Allah say, people who do not change something wrong, so people who do not change something wrong when they see it on the verge of a punishment from Allah. So there's this verse that says, those who go astray will not harm you if you are guided. But they says, no, no, you cannot allow people to go astray. You cannot allow people to violate the Sharia. Because if you do and you don't do anything about it, Allah will punish you. Allah will punish the Ummah. Right. Any comment before we go on, Jay? Yeah, there's there's another. I mean, I'm just trying to think back when Al Qaeda was in uh, all over the news, and especially when ISIS and the Taliban, they had. Let's look at the Taliban because they had a ministry called Against Vice and for Virtue. Against Vice for Virtue, which Forbidding. is much the same thing. Yes. And they called it that, and it's commanding the right and forbidding the wrong, against vice and for virtue. That's the so for people who probably aren't aware of the commanding the right. If you remember these uh, these institutions, that was their uh, that was their categories that they used for ministry of vice versus against virtue. For vi uh, I mean, against vice for virtue is another way they would yes. put it. And we're talking about the same thing. And they would always go yes. to Surah 3, Ayah 104 to support that. So you're going to the same references that they're going to. Yes. Now, people say ISIS are not real Muslims. ISIS are radicals. No. Commanding the right, the way ISIS, that is standard, normal, orthodox Sunni Islam. It is normal Islam. It is just strict Islam. Azima, not Ruhsa. And under a caliphate, it will be the norm. Azima is the standard under the caliphate. Mm -hmm. Now, those who can command the right and can forbid the wrong are people who are legally responsible. Typically, it's someone who's like, it depends on the category, 9 to 12 years old. They are legally responsible and they are able to. They are physically able and there's nothing, no impediment in the way of them doing it. Now, it says here, having the caliph's permission. Now, there's one commenter who's been saying, ah, oh, none of this is valid if there is no caliph. And that's not quite true. Right? We'll see an example of this right now. But understand, do you want it to be a caliph and do you want this to become the law? Because if there is a caliph, that means that this is a caliphate and this is the law. Now, some scholars stipulate that the person delivering must have permission to do so from the caliph. This is untrue. Any Muslim who is of legal age and is able to can do so on his own. For the Quranic verses and hadiths all indicate that whoever sees something wrong and does nothing has sinned. So stipulating that there must be permission from the caliph is mere arbitrary opinion. So this is from the greatest scholars in Islam who have written the most authoritative texts in Islam. I'm sure that that Muslim will flat out ignore this and simply continue doing as we were doing. But understand, this is the opinion of the scholars. The people in the YouTube's comments section are not the greatest scholars of Islam, even though they would like us to think so. They mention here five levels of censure. Let's have a look at those. So they say, you have to explain the nature of the act, explain the wrong nature, then admonish the person politely, then revile him 
with harshness. So notice here, reviling him and harshness, and then forcibly stopping the act, such as by breaking musical instruments or pouring out wine. Let's have a look at this word revile. Let's have a look. I pasted in some references here to the word revile. And it says here, to criticize in an abusive or angry, insulting manner. The meaning of revile is to subject to verbal abuse. Revile, if someone or something is reviled, people hate them intensely or show their hatred of that person. So now we're back to this doctrine of hatred. That's the meaning of revile. So understand, we've just seen that within the within the certificate of this book, they state that the scholar who wrote this is qualified to translate it, is fully conversant in Orthodox Sunni Islam, and he has correctly translated this. There are multiple attestations to that fact. So now understand they are to hate you. They are to act out of hatred, not out of love. Right? Let me continue. So, and then finally, use intimidation and threaten to strike the person or actually hitting him to stop what he is doing. Now, of course, as you know, when you hit someone, they just roll over and play dead. They don't hit back. Violence never escalates, fortunately. So, now notice a child is entitled to explain the nature of the act. He can admonish and advise his parents politely. And sometimes I think that this politely is within brackets. And finally, he may censure at the fourth level by such things as breaking a musical instrument, pouring out wine, and so forth. Understand, this is a very broad so forth. Your comment so far, Jay? No, I assume that that was tongue-in-cheek, your response to how people respond when they're hit. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course, of course. You don't keep your tongue in your cheek at all. <laughs> no, no, no. Now, being able to censure, it is a necessary condition that the person condemning something is able to do so. Someone who is unable to is not obliged to condemn it except in his heart. The obligation is not only lifted when physically unable, but also when one fears that problems will result for one, which also comes under the heading of inability. Muslims will say, well, if this rule was true, all Muslims would be doing it and everyone would be dead and everything would be broken. No, there are rules. There are rules that Azima, a small minority, etc. And then there are rules for how you go about this when you abstain from it. Okay, the obligation to say, real quickly. Yes, please, would, please, would, please. Not, would not one comeback be? that they, they cannot do that in the West because on the West, we have laws that prohibit them from doing that. You cannot strike somebody in the West just because you dislike what they say. Uh, and th as thank God we have those rules. So in some ways that would be, that would in, invalidate them because they live in the West. Thank God they do live in the West. If we were to travel to the East and we were to travel to a Muslim context, then this would be perfectly viable. Of course, but it also does happen in the West. It's not something that never happens. For oh, instance, we spoke that, about... We saw sorry? that happen yesterday. We saw that happen with Hatun Tosh how many times? Uh, and the Correct. times she's been hit and she's had her glasses broke off, uh, the fact that they were abusing her yesterday when she was being arrested at Speaker's Corner, uh, the fact that she was knifed and not on no Muslim came out and, and, uh, and, and actually confronted that. They defended it and said that she deserved it. This all fits under what you're saying here, and this is in the West. But mm -hmm. there are many. I showed the rule for. There are many I showed the rule about that. So openly, because the fact that we do have laws against this, uh, and what's fascinating is leaving the man who knifed her a year ago uh, it, there at Speaker's Corner, right out in the open, has yet to be caught because no Muslim will come forward to uh, to uh, spiel on him, which suggests again that they are all in conformity with what he did. Correct. Let me remind you of something. So uh, let me go back to something, Jay, for a moment. Remember this. I covered this earlier, and I need to remind this, uh, remind people of this. Notice, do not assist one another in sin and aggression, Quran 5.2. Let's see how that is interpreted. Do not give directions to wrongdoers, which includes showing the way to policemen when they're going to commit injustice and corruption. Now, that man who tried to murder Hatun Tash, he was commanding the right. He was forbidding the wrong. So to tell policemen would be to commit an injustice because this man committed no wrong. You see? Absolutely. I was fascinated even as I was looking at the videos of Hatun being, uh, uh, being arrested yesterday. What was fascinating to me 
there was a little guy, a little Muslim fellow with a green shirt on, bald head. And he was in her face. And then he disappeared. And suddenly you see him pulling the policeman. He went and got the policeman to get her arrested. Having been there to witness her being robbed of her Quran, she got robbed. He then goes and gets a policeman to arrest her, the victim. And he sits there when she's, you can watch it in the video. As she's being arrested, he's dancing and going like this and yelling, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, in her face, supporting what the police had done, using the police for himself to shut her down and to keep her from getting the Quran that they had stolen. All of this fits right under what you're saying here. So now for us, we are we're, we sat there be, befuddled. Why are the police arresting Atun? She was the victim here. The Muslims turned it completely on their head, and they used the police to their advantage. I, uh, it was it was so tragic to see what happened. But I can see now while the entire corner erupted, yelling "Aluha Bakr!" Watch as their police are leading her away. They're dancing. They're chanting. They're throwing things at her. They are absolutely joyous that she is now being arrested, though she was the one that was wronged by the very yeah. Muslims who are they now are commanding the right. They're doing nothing wrong. And it's fascinating at the very end then, the Quran that had been stolen, one of the elder gentlemen, his name is Uncle Umar, then holds up the, the stolen Quran and mocks the Christians. This is just about 15 minutes after the police had left. There at Speaker's Corner, he holds it up, unpacks it, says, look how terrible you Christians are. Look how, how you can't say that you're loving. Look what you have done to our Quran. He uses that as a vehicle to try to, even then, to try to incriminate Hatu yeah. for, what, uh, for what at Speaker's Corner is perfectly legitimate, and that is to critique and criticize. If you can't do it at Speaker's Corner, where else can you do? But this fits right into what you're saying here. They were commanding the right and they were forbidding the wrong. In this case, even using the police to get to get this done for them. Okay. Now, it says here, the obligation to censure the wrong is lifted when one knows that the repro reproach will be ineffective. So if you don't think it's gonna work, then you're allowed to walk away. When you know that the wrong will be eliminated by speaking or acting without problems for yourself, you're, you're obliged to censure it. Notice how many Muslims take on pseudonyms. They won't reveal who they are because they know they will not be punished. There is no harm to them, to their reputation. When you know that speaking will be ineffective and one will be beaten, one is not obliged to. Well, think about this. What, what are you saying? What are you inciting to the degree that, that you risk being beaten? You must be out of line to, to run that kind of risk, right? When one knows that one's censure will be ineffective, but it does not entail problems, you are still recommended to censure the act in order to manifest the standards of Islam and remind people of their religion, which is what they were doing. They were manifesting the standards of Islam and the reminding people of their religion by shouting Allahu Akbar after a theft, right? Which in Islamic law is perfectly legal. It is holy. What they've done is sacred. It, it brings glory to Allah. Hadiths that seem to show the non-obligatoriness of commanding the right and forbidding the wrong are understood by Islamic scholars as referring to very specific situations and are not global statements. Commanding the right and forbidding the wrong will be obligatory until the day of judgment. And when one knows that it will cause problems for one, but the wrong will be eliminated, such as with breaking a loot or dumping out wine, when one knows one will be beaten for it, then one is not obliged, but rather recommended to, as is evident from the hadith, the best jihad is speaking the truth to an unjust ruler. Muslims love to throw this out. Let's see how the scholars interpret this hadith. Do they do it literally, or is there like a metaphorical spin to it? Let's have a look. There is no disagreement among scholars that it is permissible for a single Muslim to attack battle lines of unbelievers headlong and fight them, even if he knows he will be killed. But if one knows, it will not hurt them at all, such as if a blind man were to hold himself against them, then it is unlawful. Likewise, if someone who is alone sees a corrupt person with a bottle of wine beside him and a sword in his hand, and he knows that the person will chop his neck if he censures him for drinking, it is not permissible to do so, as it would not entail any advantage, any religious advantage. In other words, going up to someone, stealing their things and breaking that bottle, because you're allowed to, they say don't break it, but they, later on they'll contradict themselves and they'll say smash it. But this does not entail religious advantage. So going, and in fact, you'll see later, you are allowed to break and enter. You can enter someone's property and smash 
you can enter their house and smash their property. And this is a, of religious advantage. And this is not worth giving one's life for. Such, such censure is only praiseworthy when you are able to eliminate the wrong and your actions will produce some benefit. So notice speaking the truth to an unjust ruler also includes the connotation and the clear context of fighting and killing, smashing things, attacking people. So understand how it is written and how it is understood are two often vastly different things. Any comment before I continue, Jay? Yeah, this sounds like so. This sounds like the writing of a coward. I, I, I'm finding it difficult to to uh, to understand how this these kind of injunctions. Look what it's saying. You can go after anybody as long as you know you're going to win. But if he has a sword and he's going to cut you off, then don't do it for heaven's sakes because this is unlawful. It's to me. If this is these are edicts of cowardice. Whenever there's going to be a stronger force, don't do it. But if you know you can win, then for heaven's sakes, go ahead and do it. How is attacking I, I someone, asking, smashing their goods, holy, a I, religious act? This gives pretty much leeway to any Muslim to come into someone's house, destroy their liquor, uh, take, a, take out any images of the cross. If, for as Muslims do, they find that that, that would be salacious to them. Uh, and anything that they see wrong with others their beliefs or their practices, they are given pretty much wide open detail support to go ahead and yeah. eradicate it. Right. So if one wants to censure something, but knows it will result in one's companions also being beaten, it is not permissible to do so because one is incapable of removing one blameworthy thing without its leading to another because the Muslim is the brother of another Muslim and he cannot bring harm to another Muslim. It is not lawful to censure anything reprehensible when doing so will lead to a thing or state that is more reprehensible. So I will continue. But notice they state here, Jay, they, they kind of anticipated you. Cowardice does not enter into consideration here, nor foolhardy courage, but rather the normal temperament of someone with a sound disposition. Yeah, to me, that's a contradiction in terms. The very fact that they had to put that in there, I guess someone brought that up. This sounds like someone who's a coward. No, no, this is not a coward. This is someone who has normal dead temperament who's making these injunctions. <laughs> so it looks like they've heard this before and they're responding to it. Now, problems means being beaten, killed, robbed or acquiring a bad name in town. Now, what are you doing that, that could entail you being killed? W what violence are you perpetrating that in retaliation you could die for it as a holy act? As for being reviled and disparaged, it is not an excuse to remain silent for someone who commands what is right generally meets with it. Okay, so what may be censured? So blameworthy means that its occurrence is prohibited by sacred law. This is of wider scope than mere disobedience. For someone who sees a child or insane person drinking wine is obliged to pour it out and forbid them. So you must grab the bottle, take their possessions, throw it out. Well, this will continue. Right. <clears throat> now, notice this interesting bit here. Okay. Let's say you're walking past someone's house and you hear the sound of music or you see someone drinking. It says here, okay, it is not permissible to spy on him, but an exception is if something is manifest to another outside the house, such as the sound of pipes and lutes or musical instruments being played. Someone who hears them may enter the house and break the instruments. If you smell the odor of wine outside of the house, the sounder opinion is that it is permissible to enter and condemn it. This includes smashing the bottles. We will find that out shortly. So, in other words, breaking and entering onto private property to enforce Sharia law is legal in Islam. We can look for, now. Understand, Muslims love to tell me that will not make very good sorry? neighbors of people. You can understand then why Muslims are their worst enemies. They don't realize how they come across. To have someone even read this and suggest that this is something that they can do, anybody who is in that type of environment would look down on any Muslim. This is this goes against every law of decency that I know of. Now understand, Muslims are always saying and always telling me and, and others that the Sharia is beautiful, the Sharia is perfect. And I've always asked them, why hasn't anyone opened the Sharia manuals and just read these things to us? If it is so beautiful, if it is so perfect, why the shame? Why the embarrassment? Why hide it? If it is so beautiful, why, why not 
read it to us, make it evident so that we can also appreciate its beauty. And I have not yet received a satisfactory answer. Let's continue. Right. Well, there really is no answer. You can see why, because they have read it and they know very well that if this was ever to get out, be out, put into the public sphere, this would cause an enormous amount of shame and anger by those who read it. And so you can see why what you're doing here, you're actually making mm -hmm. it public so that those of us who are, weren't even aware, I wasn't aware of all these injunctions. We can now see yeah. why Muslims do what they do and why they are such jerks publicly. They really are. They. Yeah. I can I, I I get I'm overwhelmed sometimes of the way they act, why they say the the things they say, why they use the kind of intonation they use, even what some of the acts they do for us at, at Speaker's Corner over these 25 years that I was there. Now I understand why they're doing it. It's because they have read this manual. They are aware of these injunctions and they feel obliged to do it. And they are absolutely coming across to the rest of us as real jerks and you 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 don't you say is this is your manual for for dahwa if this is how you're trying to evangelize people it's at cross purposes now see here you should not eavesdrop at another's house in order to hear the sounds of musical instruments or try to catch the scent of wine or feel for an object concealed beneath someone's shirt to see if it is a flute now this does not only apply to flutes this applies to many many things they're just using this as an example nor should you ask a person's neighbors to see what he is doing but if two upright witnesses come and inform one that someone is drinking one may enter his house and take him to task in other words you can break into someone's property and take him to task of course how you respond to people entering your property illegally well that might lead to a little bit of violence let's see how they deal with the issue of violence well they say well if you think there's going to be violence bring a friend bring two friends bring a whole gang of friends in fact bring guns too just in case so <clears throat> now people are not born scholars now the second degree exists explaining that an act is wrong since an ignorant person will often do something he does not know is blameworthy but will stop when he finds out so one must explain it politely saying for example people are not born scholars have you asked a scholar we were unfamiliar with many things in sacred law until scholars mentioned them to us so muslims are to know these legislative laws the legislation they should be familiar with this right so perhaps there are none in your hometown so you need to talk about that right now to avoid the evil of remaining silent when there's something wrong only to commit the evil of offending a muslim when able not to is like washing away blood with urine this is also why in the previous show i spoke of Maha where sorry where Ibn Qayyim speaks of Jesus being in the womb between feces and urine and blood, because these things are the three most dirty things in Islam. So therefore, Jesus was made dirty. The Christians make Jesus to be filthy, that that is their contention. So forbidding the act verbally, the third degree of severity is to prohibit the act by admonition, advice, and making the other fear Allah, mentioning the hadiths of divine punishment, right? You must be aware that if you're a learned person that you don't come across as haughty or arrogant. Well, listen, Lloyd, thank you so much. This is, um, you're, you're looking at the Reliance of the Traveler, which is the primary manual that is used in Islamic law for Muslims around the world. And that's why you're going to it. We've said this many times. It's the most common. It's the most common. And we need to go to that which is the highest, the most respected. In this case, it would be the highest respected. You've gone to book Q, page 731. On this indictment that Muslims are obliged to use, commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. And I think it's what you have done. You're going and you're unpacking the, this, the implementation of that. And you spent this video just looking at the first one, uh, explaining what is wrong. But there are so many variations on how you do that. I'm just overwhelmed with just how aggressive this is. It's not just sitting there and verbally saying that is wrong. That is wrong. You shouldn't do this. You should do that. You know, how you walk, talk, eat, drink, sleep 24 seven, everything is dictated by Sharia law. And what it's saying here, you need to say so. Now, for many of us who have been working with Muslims, myself included, uh, in my case, for 40 years, I have been struck over the years by how aggressive Muslims are in their evangelization, in their view of religion, how they wear their religion on their sleeve, more so than probably any other group I've come across. I'm not alone. Many people have said this to me. 
I now understand why. Evidently, the reason why they do wear the religion on the sleeve, the reason why they tell you exactly what they believe, we've always assumed it was because of their culture. We've always assumed it is because of the environment. But here you're finding many different cultures of Muslims who do the same thing. You go, to, you go to India where I grew up, and the Hindus are not aggressive like this, but the Muslims are. Why are the Muslims so much more aggressive than Hindus from a culture that has nothing to do with Islam? Hinduism is, has, I mean, sorry, India has always had Hinduism. Islam is, has been rather new. Until you start looking at these injunctions, these are nothing to do with a private response. There's nothing private about anything you've brought out. These are very public and they are absolutely aggressive. I can, we can't, I mean, and this makes sense now why when I have been at Speaker's Corner, uh, the 25 years I used to go down there, I would get all this in my face, overbearing, just petulant, and many times full of vitriol. Now I understand why they're told that they have to explain what is wrong verbally, to start verbally. And then they can actually go and actually, with their hands, they can actually attack, take what they don't like. That's what happened yesterday with, at Speaker's Corner. They were delighted that they grabbed that Quran that they found offensive, and they stole it. No, and everybody was clapping, and then brought the police to then arrest Hatun. And the charge was suspicion of criminal damage, which is the exact thing they did. They had the criminal damage. They were charging her with their offense. And the police fell right into the trap and they grabbed her. You saw the pictures. You saw how she was humiliated, strong arm. The Muslims dancing and prancing and yelling and hollering and, and chanting Allahu Akbar in her face, throwing things at her as they led police, let her away to the police fans. This has come straight out of this, commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. It was a prime example of exactly what you're talking about. And this should not surprise us. Now, we as Christians have always been very careful the way we come across. We do not, we, want, we are to be Christ-like. Christ did certainly raise his voice. Christ certainly did uh, overturn the tables in the temple there. There are times when Christ was very vocal with the, the Pharisees in Matthew 23. You hypocrites, you den of vipers, you white supplicants. So Christ did do that, but that is about as far as Christ ever went. He never whipped anybody. He never stole anything. He whipped animals in the temple, but not people. And nowhere are we permitted to grab things from people that don't belong, from things that don't belong to us, as the Muslims are enjoined to do. They are even enjoined and obliged to go and destroy wine and destroy a musical instruments, as the examples you gave there. Knowing that this is what they're reading, though it's not been public until you're bringing it now to the public, knowing that this is what Muslims consider their authority, they are obliged to do these acts. We need to, therefore, be, get awake. We need to be woken up. And thanks for doing this, Floyd. You're waking us up to that which should not surprise us. Now I'm not surprised. I can see why they do what they're doing. I can see why they come across the way they do. I can see why I, whenever I look at them, I say, this is not very pleasant. Are you sure you want to be saying this and doing this? Because you're not attracting many people. It's not a matter of attraction. It's a matter of intimidation. It's a context of harassment. This, I can't think of any other word. In fact, you're going to be getting into that in the subsequent videos. You're going to show how intimidation is part of this process. So harassment is part of this process. Striking with their hand is part of this process, even assaulting and the force of arms. That's yet to come. But we can see already from what you have shown. And what I like about you've done, Lloyd, is that you're not just saying this off the top of your head. You're actually quoting it verse by verse, line by line, sentence by sentence, exactly what the Reliance of the Traveler is saying in the book number Q. Because of the fact that you Thank are you. going to the sources, we now have to be, we now have to pay attention and we have to take this a lot more serious. For those who are watching, your guard, you are going to react. I'm sure you are. Listen, uh, Lloyd has said that he looks at all your comments. He tries to respond to them. He likes it when you do comment. Please do. We need to hear more of that. But do react. Let's see what you think. Let's see what you say. But if you're going to react, don't just give us your opinion, please. You support it like Lloyd has done right here. You support it by using a text. 
Go to the Reliance of the Travel. Use another, the Hadaya manual if you need to. But find out what they say, support what you're saying, and then make sure that you source it so that we can find it. God bless you. This has been great having you, Lloyd. So good to have you come on board hundreds of miles away. Until the next time, this is Lloyd and Jay. Over through 4,000 miles apart. Over and out. God bless. Thank you.